Welcome back, this is Part-Time Guardian. In this video, we will talk about the Prophecy Dungeon within Destiny 2 Season of the Arrivals. This is absolutely some of the coolest content that Bungie's ever put out. If you haven't done this, I would get into it quickly. As you've probably seen online, this dungeon is actually going to be going away after the season. Not permanently, it's due to technical issues with how they're redoing the game. But if you want to do it, and it's free to all players, I would definitely do it as soon as possible. And as always, Guardians, if you find value over this video, if you like it, feel free to subscribe to my channel. I like to put out a lot of really cool Destiny content for, again, for part-time Guardians. So, again, if you like it, please subscribe to the channel. So, this is a three-player dungeon, similar to the Pit of Heresy or Shattered Throne. The power level starts at 1040, works up to 1050 halfway through the encounter, and eventually is 1060 at the end. So, again, you're going to want to grind up a little bit. I did gain some levels as I was doing the encounter uh, because you will get drops and things like that. But again, it's something you want to spend a little bit of time preparing for, especially if you want to beat the whole thing. So for recommended weapons, and again, I'll go through all of this in each encounter, but in general, you're going to need weapons that are great at clearing ads and at doing boss damage, which again, for a dungeon should be pretty self-explanatory. When you first start this out, you're probably going to be at lower power levels. So I would recommend for supers, you work on things that protect you. So that would be wells, tethers, and bubbles. At higher levels, you can use roaming supers, but keep in mind as we talk about some of the mechanics, a core part of this is going to be collecting moats. So if you're doing a roaming super, you may not be the one who's actually trying to collect the moats, so you want to keep that in mind. We'll talk about it a little bit later. I'll break down at each encounter about what weapons to use, but in general, this is what I use if you have some really good weapons. Uh, generally, I use Anarchy, Mountaintop, and Recluse, but you can also use a good auto rifle, 21 Delirium, other things like that. There's also some snipers in different areas, so having a sniper or a scout rifle could be helpful. But again, depending on your role, you could have that versus your other teammates. If you don't have endgame weapons, stick to things that you're comfortable doing boss damage with and clearing ads. Grenade launchers, swords, SMGs, auto rifles, things like that. Again, snipers and scouts are good for the long-range snipers and encounters. And the new Wither Horde grenade launcher in the Season Pass can also work really, really well in these encounters. So it's, it's really helpful. The first encounter, you will open a series of doors using the core mechanic of the game, gathering dark and light modes. So let's talk about that. No specific loadouts are needed. Just you use whatever you like for clearing ads because this encounter versus some of the others, the ads aren't quite as bad. If you're at lower light levels, it still will be a little bit challenging for you. In the room, there are four tunnels where knights will spawn. When you kill them, moats will drop and they'll drop three moats. They drop depending on how you kill them. You'll notice as you're looking around the room, there are dark and light areas. In other words, areas that are shaded and areas that are lit up by light. Again, it depends on where you stand in the room. If you stand in a dark or shaded area, you'll notice the lowest part of your screen turns into a dark effect. That kind of reminds me a little bit of the void effect from Fault of Glass, you know, where it'll get gradually darker. In this case, it doesn't do that, but it reminds me of that effect. When you're in that effect, if you kill one of the knights, let's say it's dark, but he's staying in a light area, if your thing is still dark, you will get dark uh, motes from that night. So again, it depends on where you are and also your teammates. Basically, whoever kills him last is where it's gonna depend. So you really need to think about that as you guys are dividing up. If you're in a light area, the opposite happens and you get light motes. Grab a total of five of these, either dark or light, and then head to the plates at the end of each room you will have dark or light vapor coming from them. Once you get on these plates, you can cleanse them using R2, again, if that's which how your control is set up, similar to the Taken Essence in The Last Wish. Do this to one dark plate and one light plate, and the door will open. You'll then advance to a separate room, which again, you can go between sparrows on these if you want to, because sometimes when you die, you go all the way back to the beginning. Do this to the next room, and then another door will open, and then that encounter is done. Again, the purpose of this is just to get you comfortable with how you get moats and how the basic and that mechanic you'll be using completely throughout the entire dungeon. So that's something you'll want to get used to. Once you're done with that, climb up and you'll face the first boss, the Phalanx Echo. This encounter is similar to the first. You gather dark and light moats. You cleanse four plates, two light and two dark, and then you can DPS the boss. Sounds really simple, right? Loadouts for this encounter can vary, but for boss damage, a good whirlwind sword could be helpful with a bubble because again he's going to be in a center area so you can really take him out pretty quickly that way also in most of the dungeon grenade launchers like anarchy and mountaintop are incredible and make quick work of bosses the main thing with anarchy of course is that it does damage over time with a lot of ads going on ad clearing weapons like ar shotguns smgs come out on top 
Defensive supers come in helpful in this space is confined and staying alive is more important because there's very limited places to run and hide. My team utilized one of the largest structures to hide behind when we needed it. So basically we could hide and peek out when we needed to. When the boss comes up, he will open up for damage for a while, but after a certain point, taken goblins will spawn and shield him. So make sure you take them out quickly because it's kind of wasted if you're still trying to hit him and all of a sudden he becomes shielded. So you'll hear him them spawn when you do quickly take them out. And you could just have one person on the team do that. That's one of the ways you could divide up this encounter. With the right weapons, this is an easy one round clear as a DPS phase is generous. <laughs> you see one of our phases we got really close to that in one phase, but uh, we kind of got robbed by the game. Once you clear this, a chest will spawn that has pinnacle gear. Go to the middle of the room after that, and then you will head it off to the next encounter, the Wastelands. The Wastelands are a vast desert that you can use sparrows to explore. There are four areas of the map where taken blights will spawn. There are also roaming large invisible visible enemies. You can clear those, but we skip them through during our playthrough. Again, you could do it if you want to. Weapons for this encounter are based on your playstyle, but keep in mind there are snipers, so something long range like Mountaintop, a sniper scout can help. Also, a shotgun or high rate of fire rifle weapons are good for clearing the blights. Whatever you use, so again, if you've done the, the blight events, the, the events on uh, different destinations, you'll know what I'm talking about. Roaming supers are fine here because this encounter does not have the mode mechanic, so just go ham on whatever you want to use. There is a secret chest in this area. While exploring, if you notice an area that appears to have bright yellow paint or sand, there's a small building you can go below and grab a chest. It has gear at level from the encounter. Once you clear all of the blights, head to one of the large buildings with stairs. There's two of them within the encounter. The one that is active will have a purple aura and be open. The other one you will use later. From here, you head to the cube. Now the cube is one of the coolest puzzles I have seen to date in a Destiny encounter. And it's going to be something that's going to be a little trippy for folks. It's actually one of the best, whoever designed it, again, just really kudos to you guys because it's a really fun and interesting encounter. You'll notice a room where there are six sides that look very similar. They all have circular plates in the middle. More on this later. Weapons in this encounter are similar to what that you would use in the rest of the dungeon. There are snipers, so some sort of long range weapon is recommended. Again, you want to get those really quickly because they can really uh, take your team out if you're not careful. Supers, same as before, but again, there are moats from knights, so keep that in mind if you decide to use roaming supers. Hop over to Tolan's Aura and the encounter starts. You notice that one of the walls or, or the roof, those little circular areas we talked about earlier, you'll notice that Tolan's Aura will show up. If he is on the one of the walls, your job is to cleanse the place below him. Okay, so if he's like, again, you see a circular plate and you see a plate below him that say, let's say is dark, you'll need to get dark moats and you'll need to cleanse it. And if it's light, you'll need to do light moats. Once you do this, and again, you'll be paying attention to the ads the entire time, go to the center and your entire team will move to that part of the room. It's kind of trippy because what you're gonna do is you kind of, the whole room will rotate and you'll drop down the room. Keep in mind as you drop down, there are, each area is a little bit different, so you could potentially drop into an area and drop to the floor if you're not careful. So be careful about that. If Tolan is on the ceiling, it's actually simpler. You need to rotate the room twice, so it actually doesn't matter what you get as far as the first plate. You can do light or dark, because again, you have to rotate it twice anyway. You do this until you get to the sixth version of this, and then there'll be two bosses to, to finish this area. Collect your next pinnacle and find a door out like you came in and in the wastelands and go to the large building, not the one you came into, to go to the next area. Now you will hop in on your sparrow and head to one of the trippiest areas you'll ever find in Destiny, the Singularity. I think some serious drugs may have been used when designing this, but it's really a ton of fun. This area will have several ribbons that you can use to utilize your sparrows. Again, they're paths. Many people compare this to Rainbow Road Mario Kart, and you can see why. As you descend, there are snipers, so make sure you keep moving. Don't stop to enjoy the scenery unless you have to. There are also triangular rooms you'll notice that you can kill ads in, in different areas, but that really isn't necessary. A couple of times, the roadway be does difficult to traverse, so I did jump off uh, the ribbons, and I did go into some of those areas and climb some platforms, so again, sometimes it is necessary, and because of that, you may have to kill some ads. Towards the bottom, one of the structures has a hidden chest, that you can get it also, but it also drops, it drops gear from the encounter, but again, it's lower level. So again, it's whether you want to or not. Keep heading to the bottom and kill the final ads and jump into the rotating squares and you'll head to the boss encounter to face the Kel Echo. The final encounter, which is Kel Echo, is at max power and will challenge you while bringing together what you've learned in the previous encounters. 
weapons are similar to the other encounters. Swords are not as useful as it'd be difficult to get close to the boss to do DPS. And again, because you're doing moats in this area, you don't want to accidentally pick up the wrong moats. For me, I used Anarchy, Mountaintop, and Recluse. But again, a good grenade launcher, ARs, SMGs will work. Snipers or scouts for snipers can help out in the boss encounter. Again, swords can work, but again, you just have to keep in mind about the, the modes. But again, it's not useful for the boss. And then defensive supers again rule here. The room is divided into three zones where copies of the eventual boss will spawn. There are a ton of ads at max level. The key to this encounter, since there's very few places to hide, is clear one of the zones quickly as possible to establish a place to keep safe. My team start in the middle with defensive supers to set up a perimeter because, again, you will get your supers by the time you get back to the boss, so it's really important if you can to try to get one of those places cleared as quickly as possible. You'll want to focus on one of the three zones. Each one has a dark or light plate to cleanse. Cleanse the plate and an ogre will spawn. Kill the ogre and a copy of the kel that was behind you will leave, allowing you to have a place to stay safe. Do this three times and the middle will open, again the purple area like ha you've had in other parts of the encounters, and you'll face the boss. The boss encounter takes place on a series of plates. The boss will move through the plates and head to an exit. He has an aura around him that will protect you from the room. If you get out of this buff, and again the buff stays a decent amount so you can typically say like a plate away from him and you can still get it, but if you get out of it you will get a dark entropy effect. If you get this times 10 you will die. So you want to stay with the boss, which again stay, means staying within a plate or two of him. He will also fire one of those like taken captain orbs at you. But in this case, what it'll do is it'll push you all the way back to the entrance. The bad thing about this, you get pushed back to the entrance, you get taken out of that protective aura, and you basically get that entropy effect put on you. And if you go back far enough, you'll actually wipe because of that. So try to avoid these, even if you have to take some momentary time off doing DPS damage. There are small ads and snipers, so it might be good to have one person concentrate on that. That's what we ended up doing, so everyone else can work on the boss. Stay with the boss and slowly work him down. Anarchy works well here, as well as tethers. Eventually, he will go to the back of the room and leave the room, and entropy effect will stop. Once this is done, you can head back to the room. Keep in mind, the rooms, when you go back, change each time, so they will set up differently with different places to hide or drop through holes and dies. Keep that in mind. Keep doing this mechanic until he dies. We did this in four tries with underpowered guardians, but our DPS got better each time. I can say this eventually become a three or two phase mechanic. And honestly, towards the end, I think we did enough damage in one phase where we definitely could have three phased him. Except you super try hards that will figure out how to do with one phase strats. You know who you are. Finish this and you get a pinnacle drop at the boss. Again, this is before the chest. This is when you actually kill the boss. Then go to the room with a nine, and there's some dialogue between Drifter and Eris. It's pretty cool. It's interesting. Um, I don't know if it'll be different dialogue every week because it didn't seem like that. It seemed like it might be an evolving story, so we'll just wait and see. The final chest is not pinnacle, but again, it's more gear from the encounter. It's at level, so that's cool. This is by far one of the most innovative and fun encounters I've ever faced, and that's not to take anything from the Shatter Throne or Pit of Heresy. Shatter Throne was a very unique encounter when we first got it, right? And it was very well done very dark very foreboding pit of heresy fit in really well with what it was placed but this one this is like they said hey do whatever you want with the encounter and they did that for sure my team did this in two hours with under leveled and not understanding all the mechanics we'd watch some videos but we didn't really understand the mechanics completely this will easily be a sub hour event in the future again it is super fun well designed and has more of that wrath machine flavor of constant action moments and lots of Lots of hero moments potentially. There were plenty of times in the encounter where we had Last Guardian standing and you had to, you know, kind of re revive your whole team. And that's also why one thing that's really helpful in this is like if you have a hunter that can do, te do go hiding, you know, can use that. Um, that will really be helpful in this encounter. So it is open all players and it'll be taking a break in the season. So make sure you do this right now. That's the video, guys. I hope you enjoyed it. I enjoyed making it. Again, super fun encounter. If you did enjoy it, feel free to like the video and subscribe to my channel. That really helps me out. Get into the comments, tell me what you'd like to see next. And I'll see you guardians in the tower.